This time on the show, security breach. LinkedIn loses 6.4 million password hashes. And what does that mean to you? We're talking one-way hashes, salting, and the end of MD5. Plus Raspberry Pi, an exclusive interview with the Little Boards founder at Maker Faire 2012. All that and more this time on Hack5. This episode of Hack5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. It's your weekly dose of techno loss. It is, and I'm glad to be up here, and I'm so excited. Yeah, I hear you have a special announcement at the end of the show. Oh, Uh-oh. I do. Oh, yeah. You better hash that one and then give Stick them the key later. Uh-oh. Stick around. Let's salt that. Hey, <laughs> we're going to talk about salting and hashes and stuff. I know that yes. we've, been, we've been sprawling through this whole series on, like we say, proxies, but really it gives us a great excuse to talk about. kind of the perfect time, isn't it? It kind of is. <laughs> you know, we've been talking about SSH and then through that we talked a little bit about encryption and hashing yep. and algorithms and things of that nature, which mm-hmm. is so cool because on our way through like, you know, this and PGP, GPG, VPNs and stuff, there's all these awesome technologies that branch out of it. I know, God, I've learned so much just about, you know, plain old encryption. I didn't know there was so much on the back end that well, happened. Well, it's really fun because we like normally just kind of like assume everybody's up to speed and then we get these emails and yeah. even though, even if you are one of those people that's like, yes, I know all this stuff, I we still get emails that are like, dude, I know all this stuff and it's awesome to watch. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. I'm it's just nice like, to see a breakdown. Yeah, I'm really having fun with this. Um, so speaking of which, there's a little bit going on in the news right now. Yes. Yeah. These guys <laughs> linked in. Which, if you don't know, they are a website that's um, basically in charge of, like, you, you create a profile and it's... Um, it's for professionals. You get on there and you can look for jobs and you can uh, upload your resume and things like that. So there's a lot of important data that you can put on your LinkedIn if you wanted to. Luckily, I didn't because I really hate the setup of that website. Right, and they lost 6.4 million hashes. Mm. In fact, they were SHA-1 hashes. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, the others, Last FM and eHarmony, have, have not confirmed what it is that they lost. Hopefully, they're not like some of those websites uh, you visit where they have plain yeah. text passwords. All of my fashion websites, every single one of them sends me plain text emails all the time. It drives me absolutely insane. You know, this is just like when we were talking about the shadow file in Linux mm-hmm. and like that slash Etsy slash password, and there's an X, and then that points to a shadow file that yes. has a password. And this is like kind of the, talking about the proper ways to do this. And, and whatnot. And I just figured, you know, as long as we're, we're on the subject because of the stuff in the news, we can go ahead and just do a little quick recap here on that SHA-1 that we talked about. Yeah, so SHA-1 hashes, I saw this and I was like, oh, okay, so I should be fine because it's it's hashed. Well, but... yes and no. And and this kind of harkens back to something that we talked about in like season five yeah, on the beach or the, something. Uh, but the margaritas. So, uh, <laughs> so SHA-1 stands for Secure Hash Algorithm, and it's actually the predecessor to SHA-0, little bug fix, we get SHA-1. This came out of NIST, we talked about them before, the National National Institute of something or something. Standard Technology, it's Uh. it's somewhere in there, anyway. (laughs) And so, uh, actually there was a published flaw in uh, SHA-1 in 2005, so that was, um, uh, that brought upon SHA-2. Two, and so shot two is actually what? Oh, yeah. There SHA we go. two, which is actually a set of hash algorithms that includes SHA two twenty four, two fifty six, uh, three eighty four, five twelve. Different. You might bit imagine lengths. that the next one would be ten twenty four. Anyway. Right. Um, and yeah, so those are exactly different bit lengths. Okay. And so that's pretty cool. Of course. Um, you know, there's SHA-3 coming around, so that's oh, going to be fun. Oh, there is. Yeah. Uh, the NIST, um, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, yeah, I was right, um, <laughs> needed, it said back in 07, they were yeah. like, hey guys, we need a replacement to, to the, you know, the secure hashing algorithm. Who wants to make SHA-3? And so, like, everybody's all like, oh, why don't you SHA-3? <laughs> nice. Yeah, and, um... And through some conferences and some other stuff, mm-hmm. basically people submit and they say, all right. And then they're like, you know, you're on my dodgeball team and you're out. And right. then 2012, this year, we're supposed to see the result, who the winner is and what the algorithm is and how okay. we use it and stuff. And, and so that's exciting because, you know, it's important to have these secure 
um, algorithms here that will allow us to do one-way hash functions. And this, again, is, is our favorite thing here. So I'm going to say SHA-1. I'm going to say in parentheses Math. Math. <laughs> so uh, st study that, and then you'll be able to explain this a little bit more. <laughs> um, and so let's do a couple of examples here using okay. these one-way hashing functions. So, okay. you know, if I were to, say, sign up for an account over at LinkedIn or one mm -hmm. of these places, right, and, and I come up with my password here, my password, I'm going to choose something. I think I'm being really creative. I'm not using a dictionary word. I'm going to use Dagobah. So not quite dictionary. You must go to the Dagobah system. It's like this. What is this? Star Wars. It's Star Wars. Yeah, Star this is Wars where you would uh, anyway. Dictionary. So uh, actually, I'm going to Dagobah just as soon as we wrap shooting. I'm heading over to Bodega Bay, just oh, north of nice. here in California. Yes. Yeah, which is oh, a anagram. For, Gotta tell me how that is. Yeah. yeah you switch some letters around, you get. Uh, uh, Bodega. Bodega. Ah, see, yeah. okay. Thank I you, George it. Lucas. That's where it came from. Speaking of which, I didn't even tell you, George Lucas was um, just downstairs the other day. So, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, he was at the sandwich shop. Nuh -uh. No, I'm so serious. You're lying. Yeah. Are you it's serious? Confirmation. Did you get a anyway, picture? No. I'm oh not going to stop George Lucas on the screen. And be <laughs> I like, would. Oh. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, completely irrelevant to this discussion, <laughs> but very cool. Um, so if I put Dagobah into a, a database, the uh, the big cylinder, if you will, I'm not going to put Dagobah. That's just stupid. I'm going to use SHA-1 right. and come up with a hash of it. And so that resulting hash would be, let's see, E0, E25A7A0404, E, yada, yada. It goes so on this E twenty five four zero four blah blah. That's what LinkedIn or last or whoever is going to well, see we, we've if they use SHA one. That LinkedIn uses that hashing algorithm uh, to store their passwords. Okay. okay. Now, here's the thing about that. When you start thinking in the mind of an attacker, what right. you think, what you come up with is like, okay, great. So if you just store Dagobah as this, mm -hmm. and then say like when I go to log in. I pass this through HTTPS, and then they run it through a hash algorithm. See, they don't need to know your password. They're like, what yeah. did you send me? Cool, let me hash that. Uh -huh. Does it equal this? If it does, you're in. Right. A hacker does the same thing, except you can do a really cool way is, you know, the old way is just like brute force, just like try Try apple, apple try banana, try cucumber, going through the dic dictionary like yeah, that, and then, right? So if A is for apple and B is for banana and C is for cucumber, then obviously D is for Dagobah. Right, of course. Right, <laughs> the alphabet of hack five. And so <laughs> rather than compu and, and you know, coming up with this, this right here is what we call computationally expensive. It, yes. It, it takes a moment to do. So a lot of times what, uh, what hackers will do is, is come up with these there, time, memory, trade-off. What is that? Well, the idea is it takes a lot of time to come up with one of these. Mm -hmm. But if you can trade off some memory in the sense of like gigabytes or, well, just bytes in general, you get some hard drive space. Yeah. Again, the cylinder. You've got a really big cylinder and uh, enough of these uh, CPU guys. Mm -hmm. that, that's my CPU to it's the very one cute. there. Yeah. Thank you. He's a, he's a happy CPU. It's kind of like a spider. Actually, he's got, he's got <laughs> eyebrows. He's, he's really, he's an evil CPU. And then he's smoking a cigarette. Oh yeah, that's evil. Right there. Okay. Anyway, so you guys did tune in for um, for this Bob Ross session, but what you wanted to know is that so if you were to come up with these time and memory trade-off tables, it would look like this. It would seriously be password hash. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, we would take apple, maybe lowercase, uh, banana, and cucumber. And then we would come up with the resulting hashes and say it's F327, E9, whatever. Yeah. Right? And then this one would be E0, E172, and then this one would be F2, E6, whatever, right? And so what you do is just like when we were to log in and mm -hmm. I give you the password and you say, okay, let's hash that. Does it equal what I have in my table? In that sense, you're, you're just doing it so that you're like, you know, not storing the password in yeah. plain text. We talked about before how you could log in with 
here's, oh, let's, let's agree upon some random numbers and stuff, and yep. if you take this and you hash your thing, what do you get, and does it equal that, right? Yep. Uh, which gets into a longer discussion, and I can't wait to touch on Kerberos, because we'll have to get Kirby here to guest host. <gasps> oh, yes. Yeah. That'll be good um, times. But uh, see, Babe's hosting the show. Just saying. <laughs> Kirby making an appearance. Yep. But uh, so just like you know, we would to check the database, uh, a hacker would say, hey, all right, so I don't, I don't, they don't have this. They have this. And so they say, all right, great. So what does this equal? I don't know. So they're going to take that, and they're going to reverse engineer it into their table. Yeah, and so the idea uh -huh. is, you know, it takes a lot of one of these to produce a file that's a lot of these. Yeah. But you only have to do that once. And so now that you got this huge table, you can say, great, let's see, E0, E. Let's say, no, that's an F. Uh, e, oh, E, 0, E, OK, uh, 2, uh, 1. OK, nope. so it's not banana. <laughs> no, it's not that one. It's not that one. So you go down the list until you get to Dagobah, and then you're like, whoa, I just right. heard your password. Da -da 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 -da. Now, what if you're using something like Dagobah with a 3 in the middle or a 13 at the end or something like that? Well, then like you'd that. have to have a large-ass table that has those 3s and 13s at the end of them, right? And so that is, you're just talking about creating a secure password yeah. by using numbers and letters and characters and making them really long. Like, should I worry if I have a super, you know, secure password or something that was randomly generated okay, on Okay, so think about, it, think about it like this, right? You've got this huge table of passwords, and yeah. this this computationally is super expensive. It takes a huge one of these, and you're going to need a lot of gigabytes to store this stuff. Yeah. And so, when you go to create your tables, like any of the Hack Five uh, participants that um, th that joined in to create uh, the the full set of LM hashes, and those are uh, ah, alphanumeric, yes. all uppercase, seven characters. Yes. You know that right there is a um, is a set of let's say 36. Um, there's probably a couple symbols in there, but let's say 36 possible characters. Okay. Seven, char uh, seven character length, because uh, of the way that it splits the function. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that right there was, I, I can't remember if it was like 300 gigs or 500 gigs, but it was huge and it took weeks. Wow. Months even, and it took a lot Jeez. of people and a lot of coordination. So as you can imagine, the, so if that was like 500 gigs, and that's seven characters. Yeah. Imagine if we made it eight characters. Oh it's my not, gosh. oh, one more character, it's twice the speed. No, it's not. It's yeah. not like now it's a terabyte. You know, it's exponential. Yeah. And so the curve goes whoop as you add, start adding characters. And so, you know, as an attacker, you're like, you know what? I'll just go for this set right here uh, okay. of like seven to eight character passwords because, you know, those are easy and that's what most people use. They're not going to worry about all those crazy ones that the more secure people like to use. 83 characters. 83? 83? I thought it really was like easy. 42 last I, time. Well, it turns out if you type the 42 oh character password in twice, is that oh. much longer. Now, <laughs> we can talk about entropy and how that's not necessarily like cryptographically sound. Right. However, when you get to my hash in the database, I'm sorry, that's some things a landmine. <laughs> it's not going to be in your table. They're going to look at that and, and be like, try to yeah, no. It, it's just going to be like <laughs> banging your head against the wall because anyway, just the, the eons that it's going to take with current computing to come up with it. Now, of course, I bring all this up because, like I said, if this is in the database, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got an insecure password, then, then all hacker has password. to do is run it through their table and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. And so what we do, and we've talked about this in the past, what we do is get a little bit of salt up in our hashes. Mm, the salty hash browns. And so, <laughs> so we had talked about how, uh, you know, this is the unhashed equivalent of my password. But if I were to say, take a, a, like two digits, just take like a, like just two bytes and add them when I create my password. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to go degoba, but it's going to be hashed with say uh, a one and a three, right? Okay. And so that is going to equal uh, nine. 3F282 EFAB63. I'm doing all this in my head, guys. As you guys know, it's like SHA1 is like built in. But. Um, so you're it, talking about like actually using the password Dagobah13, or no. this is the actual salt that they add to your. Exactly. Hash. This cool. one's my password. This is the salt that's added. And what's beautiful right. about this is so like I use the password Dagobah at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and they salt it with 13 and we get this in their database, right? Okay. Well, I use the password Dagobah again. And um, somebody else uses the salt 37. Ah, so it changes. Yes. The and so in that change. case, it's going to be 
559CE40F65F8B2CF807. <laughs> Stop me. It goes on and on and on. And so, you know, the thing is, both of these passwords are the same. However, right. since we're using a different salt each time, now the in hash comes out different every single time. Which is so beautiful. And because uh, they can't reverse engineer it into their table and yeah. figure it out. I mean, they could by like running your password through the database and then trying, you know, every possible hash. But you're talking yeah, but that's, about so much. Nobody's going to do that. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, I just thought that that was kind of an interesting thing to bring up in that, mm -hmm. like, LinkedIn said, like, dude, we didn't salt our hashes. Yeah. And so it's like, dudes, why that? didn't you do that? Yeah. Um, so if you have a password there, go and change it. Hopefully you mm -hmm. didn't use it anywhere else. I mean, obvious yeah. best practice is you don't use the same password twice right. in different systems. So if they cracked it there, they're not going to get into your last FM and find out that you actually like Nora Jones. <laughs> don't even try. <laughs> no, you like Nora. <laughs> uh, so uh, Daft Punk all the way. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea is that if they, if both of these were to hash it, like we said, these would be different. This might be your last FM and this might be your LinkedIn and mm -hmm. everything's all happy, right? Well, uh, no, I mean, not that you should be using Degaba on all your sites or anything. Of course. But, uh, you know, this is in the context of SHA-1 uh, with and without hashes. Now, it's also kind of interesting that this comes up because as soon as this came out, there was a bunch of articles, uh, there was one ZDNet about how MD5, as we know, uh, that's message digest algorithm. It's another one-way hash. Uh, so let's put that here in red with the rest of them. M yeah, we D love MD5. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's awesome. It's what we use for the key fingerprints for our uh, SSH servers. Right. Usually, mm -hmm. you know, and we talked about the different algorithms that SSH will use. Uh, MD5, Message Digest 5, it's a hash algorithm. It creates a 128 bit value. It is the replacement for MD4, and it was created by Ron Rivest in 1991. You know, Ron Rivest from um, RSA. Yes. And so, uh, the thing about this is this this uh, article that's making the rounds right now in ZDNet all about how the MD5 authors, uh, you know, basically say uh, MD5 is, as we know, E-O-L or end of life. Uh, that's the story that's end making the rounds in ZDNet. Yeah. That's not good, right? Well, you know, it means that we need something to replace it. I mean, uh, the, the recommendation is... MD6! Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think we're. <laughs> I think right now the best you can do is SHA-256, use some saltiness, or, well, you know, actually, would that be better? Yeah, 512. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always say, you'd, like, use whatever the best at your disposal, whether it's a DSA key right. of 2048 or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of interesting that this comes about now, and, like, this, these articles, like, oh, the MD5 authors denounce MD5 as end of life, when back in 09, I mean, pretty much uh, the Engi Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, there was a draft uh, back in 09 that mm -hmm. for, actually this was for uh, DNS uh, extensions, where the working group was all like, hey, the quote, MD5 is no longer universally acceptable, and it may lead to an increase, uh, I'm sorry, in to increasing operational issues. SHA-1 is likely to suffer the same kind of problem. In ah. summary, MD5 has reached end of life, and SHA-1 will likely follow in the near term, so they've been knowing this is going to happen for the past three years. Well, yeah, and that's probably why there are like facilities being built in Utah. To, anyway, yeah. we'll talk about that <laughs> some other time. But uh, this is, and so the recommendation was SHA-256. Okay. And so what's interesting about all of this, and the reason that we have this discussion again, is because when it comes to something that you know, something that's near dear to your heart, right? Um, credit card payments. I mean, you used to work oh, yeah. in merchant services, yeah. right? And so when it comes to like, if I go to a, a website and I'm going to, you know, make a transaction mm -hmm. online, right? Um, I'm going to make sure that, you know, they follow this thing called uh, PCI. And there's this- Yeah, this PCI standard, compliance. Yeah, it's uh, PCI DSS. It's mm -hmm. the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And so there's a standard in the sense that would like, you know, because credit card numbers are so stupid. It's yeah. one factor of authentication. It's something you know, it's terrible. the credit card number, and something you know, the expiration date. And something, you know, the zip code and this, oh, we're going to make it more secure by putting a number on the back of it that isn't raised. Something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, chip and pen. Why, why are we not there? But, um, but in that credit card industry, there's uh, PCI. 
And so there are some stupid websites that put up like, like have you ever seen those? We Mac are badges? PCI compliant. Have you seen those badges on on the websites that are like McAfee tested and secure daily, oh, yeah. and it's got Fair like the date. secure. It's like wow, you know how to use image magic and put a date on a banner. That Every says, time I see those, I'm like, that means nothing to me. Exactly. It really depends on if you're actually using the compliancy rules, and if you're not, you could get charged millions. But that's this is this is actually story. you know this is actually why the hack shop uses a third party uh, provider to mm -hmm. do to manage our storefront because it's like one we don't see I don't want to I don't want to take on nope. any of that responsibility yeah, you I know don't it's either. like it's a lot to deal with and anyway um, I know that a lot of our pen testers in the audience could uh, drone on and on and sigh uh, yes about PCI but the reason that I bring that up is because you know when I go to sign up for an account at last FM or mm -hmm. LinkedIn or wherever there's no badge that tells me what they use oh, cryptographically. We're salting. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah, there's and, nothing and there. My question is like, industry, why not? Why are you not saying, hey, come and sign up with us because, you know, we use OAuth or yeah. we use SHA1 with salty hashes or, or 256 or whatever. And it's like, you're not, it's not like a trade secret, if anything. No, there, it's not. There should be badges. It should be like a thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I think, I don't know if that's like the final answer or whatever, but yeah, I, I hate the idea that like, I'm, whenever I'm logging, especially whenever I have to like sign up for like something related to what we do, like, yeah. like I was just signing up RSA, I mean, grant or not RSA, Black Hat. Mm -hmm. and so I'm just signing up for Black Hat, press credentials, get into the thing, cover the show, right? And, and it's Black Hat, so you're and like, it's, and so mm. I'm like, oh, what password do you use with the Black Hat? Obviously, maybe you let's generate a brand new one that you well, don't use on any other sites. Well, that's what you do for every single one of them, but you I'm should. always like, <laughs> you know, I should have put an Easter egg in this password because I'm wondering, anyway, like, Is you anybody never looking know. at these? Yeah, yeah, you really don't I know. I hate that. You know, the only protection, honestly, that I use right now is like generating a different password on all the sites, and I, the first time I sign up, I always check my email because if they send me my plain text password, <sighs> that's my first sign that I need to make sure I don't save any data in their well, site. Well, this is why plaintextdefenders.com exists. I love that site so much. Yeah, so whenever <laughs> you find somebody that's storing their passwords in plain text, go ahead and send them an email, or yep. not send them an email, post it, and they'll basically the wall of sheep. Yeah. yeah. And so, I don't know, other than like public ridicule or, you know, like LinkedIn, Last.fm, and, and eHarmony are having like bad weeks now, and hopefully, you know, this is not the first time this happened. This is, all of this has happened before, and all, all of, of it will happen, happen again. again. The eternal return. Oh, so frack. not that we have the answer to any of this, just <laughs> saying it would be really nice if there was some sort of a not compliance, but some sort of industry standard for at least announcing what you're using. Because if you're not using yes. anything, if you're using MySQL and a blob field, <laughs> one, good on you for using a blob field. Well, now that Darren is done venting about the uh, ongoing issues with encryption on websites, <laughs> we do have some awesome answers about a really cool little device that we are very excited to see. Yay! Oh, the it's it's Raspberry, raspberry it's Pi. Pi. It's the Raspberry Pi. So stay tuned because coming up, we are going to be talking to the founders of Raspberry Pi. But first, here's a quick break. If you're setting up a website for your new business, showcasing your portfolio, your new blog, domain.com is the best place to go for your next great idea. If you need to register a new domain, consider getting a new .com. You see, a .com is the original. We all know it's the best. It's globally understood. It has immediate credibility no matter what name you choose. Or if you're even into investing and buying and selling domains, .coms have the greatest aftermarket value. Find new .com domains over at domain.com. You know, Shannon and I love them because they're so easy to use, they're affordable, they're reliable. Plus, Domain.com, they're so active on social media like Twitter, they're at Domain.com, they got great customer support. It's really just a fun place to do business. So the guys over at Domain.com want to hook our fans up with an additional offer. Get this 15% off the already affordable domain names and web hosting if you use the coupon code HACK5, H-A-K-5, at Domain.com's checkout. That's 15% off and big savings, so don't forget to use the coupon code H-A-K-5. When you think domain names, think Domain.com. Here at Maker Faire 2012, I have the pleasure of being here with Eben Upton. Hey, Eben, how are you? Yeah, not bad. A little bit jet lagged, but otherwise good. So you are the brilliant person behind. I'm a person behind Raspberry Pi, along with a large number of other people, all kind of standing press around it. So yeah, Raspberry Pi. So how did that project come about for, and what is it for those that aren't familiar with it already? 
Okay, so this is this is our attempt to get kids programming again. Uh, we really, really, really want children who are like six years old to be programming because you don't make a you don't make a concert pianist by sitting them down at a piano when they're 18. Uh, you make it by sitting them down when they can basically just about move their fingers. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give them a platform that's cheap enough, powerful enough, they can learn to program the same way we did back in the 80s. And so how did the project come about? So uh, I was working for the university in Cambridge. And one of the things we do at the university is we, we interview 17-year-olds, uh, 18-year-olds to come to university and study computer science. And every year, fewer people. Uh, every year, the stuff they knew how to do got less and less and less impressive. They were still bright kids, but they just hadn't had any experience. And so you spent your first year when you should be teaching them. You've got three years to get them from uh, school, to get them from high school, to be able to start a doctorate, right? So you can't spend the first year teaching them how to, like, write Hello World. So uh, this is a real problem for us. And, and kind of our idea was that what's changed? Why has this changed? Well, uh, we used to have programmable machines. We used to have our Timexes and our Commodore 64s, our TRS-80s. Uh, now we don't have them anymore. So we were just trying to produce a computer which is cheap enough. You can give them to every kid, and then they can have a, those experiences that we have. So rather than break out the 286, you decided to go ahead and build a platform. Uh, how, how are these platforms different than some of the other educational programming platforms that already exist? For example, the Arduino. Okay, so uh, several things. One, uh, okay, you picked the Arduino, but uh, compared to some other small board computers, very, very cheap. Um, compared to Arduino, we're about the same price as an Arduino, uh, but we, we have a lot more uh, processing power. You can connect us to a display. You, know, one of the, you, know, you see a lot of kids hacking with Arduinos, but they need to have a PC as well to do the develop, development on. So we're kind of a, a much more standalone platform than that. And so what do you need to develop on yours? Uh, you need a display device. So you can use an old television, you can use an old composite television, an old NTSC television. You use a shiny new HDMI television or a DVI monitor. You need to have a mouse and a keyboard. Uh, you need uh, a power supply, and we use a mobile phone charger for that. And you need to have somewhere to store your data, so an SD card will do nicely. And what's the language like? Uh, it's just a Linux box, right? So it's whatever you want to program, uh, whatever you want to use, pretty much. So um, obviously the Pi and Python gives you a bit of a clue as to what we think is a good language. But uh, we've got people using Ruby, people using Perl, people using C. Uh, no Java yet, although we'd like to try and solve that. Uh, so we're just trying to give people the full, the full spectrum of choice. We're just a component supplier. We're not trying to dictate to anyone what language they have to use. And you say it's just a Linux box, but what's under the hood hardware-wise? We have, um, we have an ARM 11, we have a, a 700 megahertz ARM 11 core. Uh, so we have a kind of a middling amount of pressing power. This is kind of like a PC from the early part of the last decade. Um, we have very, very strong multimedia though. So we, uh, we have between a PlayStation 2 and a PlayStation 3's worth of 3D rendering performance. Uh, we can play 1080p video. We can actually record 1080p video, although we haven't released a camera board yet. We have just put some pictures on our blog. Uh, first proof of life from our first peripheral board, which is, a, which is a 14 megapixel camera. We might downgrade that to a five megapixel before we launch to keep the cost down. Um, so we have this enormous amount of multimedia and a fairly reasonable amount of general purpose compute. And so what was the biggest challenge in keeping that cost down and what was the uh, motivation in your price point? Uh, well, so the, the motivation for the price point was completely ridiculous, that we wanted it to be the same price as a textbook. Uh, that demonstrates that we have no idea what textbooks cost, because they do not they cost $25, $35, absolutely. Yes. Um, so uh, we wanted it to cost the same as our insane hallucination as to, uh, of, of what uh, textbooks cost. Um, uh, keeping the price down, a lot of work to reduce the size of the PCB, because small means cheap. Uh, a lot of work to reduce the component count, because you know less robot assembly time means cheap. Uh, lots and lots of work, and I wasn't involved in this, but lots and lots of work to um, uh, kind of choose very cheap, cheap but reliable connectors. You know, generally with say an HDMI connector, you can you can have uh, available, cheap, reliable. Pick two if you're lucky. Yeah. You know, if you want to pick three, uh, then y y you need to spend a lot of time trawling through catalogs trying to find stuff that's going to work for you. And so what kind of manufacturing experience did you have before the Raspberry Pi? Uh, none at all. And, and this was part of the fun for me. I mean, I was, I've always wanted, I've run software startups and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. But I've always really wanted, well, I was naive. I, I always said I really wanted to run a company that had inventory, that had, you know, a warehouse and inventory and had to worry about goods in and goods out. And of course, the first thing I discovered was I really didn't want to do that at all. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we were manufacturing this in China. Um, we were very lucky. Uh, one of the, uh, a guy who works for uh, Broadcom Sales and Marketing out there helped us out. You know, he was able to, he had, he had some contacts. He was able to find us a really reliable CM who do uh, MP3 players as their, ma their main line of business. So they found us a really good, reliable CM. Uh, it's obviously slightly 
uh, nerve-wracking uh, when you send $25,000 and $25,000 worth of chips to some guy in Shenzhen. And then he says, yeah, sure, I'll send you 2,000 computers. Yeah. Uh, and, but of course he did. And so we've had these kind of really surprisingly positive uh, experiences of manufacturing. Of course, now we're not doing manufacturing. Our partners, Element 14, uh, Premier Funnel, and uh, RS Components, um, so that's uh, Newark and Allied in the United States. Uh, they, they handle all of that for us. So they're doing distribution. They commission the manufacture of these things. So we've actually become now a very lightweight company. We've actually retreated to what I'm comfortable with, which is being an IP licensing company. So it's been almost a year since the, the first public announcement of this, and it's been a long time coming to get these to market. What do you kind of wish that you knew then that you now know? I guess I wish I'd known what happens if you go and see a BBC journalist and he says, can I take a video of your little toy and put it on my blog? I wish I'd known that by doing that you accidentally promised to make everyone in the world a $25 computer. Because, uh, you know, we said you could do it, but we just didn't appreciate that it would be 600,000 YouTube uh, views in two days. Um, so, so, yeah, I wish I'd known that. Maybe we would have waited a few months until we were slightly further down the line um, before announcing. On the other hand, you know, maybe it kind of encouraged us to work a little bit harder. Um, yeah, I guess that's probably the, that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, you know, we've tried what we've tried to do. We've tried to be really open. I um, mean, what we say is, you know, our uh, well, my personal inspiration is um, Elon Musk, right? The guy who runs SpaceX. And you know, those guys they've done a very similar sort of thing on a shoestring budget, hundred million dollars, which is shoestring for aerospace. They built a rocket, and while they were doing it, they told everyone what they were doing, and what this meant was the press generated a constant stream of articles about how they were late. You know, they'd say we're going to try and do this in 2005, and they do it in 2007, and then. You know, they get this reputation for being late, where if they'd just been quiet about it, they wouldn't have had this problem. But ultimately, I think the upsides of that kind of openness really outweigh the downsides. And so once you uh, overcome your, your current challenge of, uh, of actually getting enough of them to market, because there is so much demand, what's on the horizon for the Raspberry Pi? I guess uh, for the foundation, probably a return to some of our educational roots, actually trying to make sure that we have the support material required to help teachers and also help learners. Yeah, because I think a lot of this is going to be about self-directed learning as much as it is about teachers. Uh, so making sure there's support material, software support material, um, uh, documentation for these people. Um, there are a small number of expansion boards we're going to do ourselves. By and large, we're looking to the community to do expansion boards. We've got Adafruit, we've got one coming. We've got one called the Gert board, which is a, uh, it is a third party expansion board, but it was designed by uh, Gert Van Loo, one of our volunteers, a very good friend of mine. Um, so it's almost an in-house expansion board, but most expansion boards are going to be out of house. The ones we're going to keep in-house, things like displays and cameras. Uh, where we have to make modifications to the firmware to support those. So yeah, camera board is the camera board is going to be the big story of Q3, I think. So what about licensing as far as the hardware and the firmware are concerned? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, us getting licenses to, to, to do it, or whether we're going to allow other people to, to to do stuff with it for the community? Uh, okay, so we are um, hoping at some point to open source uh, all of our hardware design. So at the moment, we've released our schematics. So we've, we've actually released enough stuff that somebody who was sufficiently determined could go and make a Raspberry Pi, right? Because the schematic level is the is actually probably where, for us, the cleverness is. We haven't released the PCB designs. We probably will do that fairly shortly. Um, uh, there's some work to get the chips into general distribution. There are chips in that device which aren't generally available to people. So we need to do some work to get those available. On the software side, uh, we have, I guess there are three things. We have all of our kernel sources are obviously open, they have to be. Those are on GitHub, we maintain a GitHub repository with that. Um, we have uh, binary firmware for the, uh, that runs on the, AS uh, runs on the um, DSPs inside the ASIC. That's the uh, video core, what we call video core side stuff, that, that implements the GPU. That stuff's never going to be open sourced, right? It's not even for a chip that anyone has a compiler for, so there's very little point in us open sourcing that stuff. Uh, we then have these user land binary modules. Now, I would love to be able to open source those. I think there are some real challenges around being able to do that. What it does mean is that when we start supporting non-Linux operating systems, we're going to have to do some work to provide, say, you know, a NetBSD version of those of those objects, you know, uh, uh, Plan 9, someone was talking to me about Plan 9. So uh, there's going to be a burden on us. We are going to try and do something, but it's I think it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a long road. All right, and so what haven't I asked you that the hackers at home should know about? Ah, uh, I don't know. Um, let me think. Uh, people should know. People should know this thing goes really nicely with Arduino. We play really, really nice with Arduino. If you look out there, there are people starting to do tutorials of uh, using this with Arduino, using it currently as a, a device that drives the Arduino that connects to it via, say, to a Nuno via a serial cable. Um, that works really nicely because it means you get all the best of the Arduino. You get the low power consumption on the Arduino. You get the uh, the analog input 
uh, you get a little bit more digital. You get the five volts, which is a big deal for people because we're three v three natively. Um, so that works well. Medium term, we really want to get those Arduino development tools on because we want to free the Arduino people from having to have a PC to host the development environment. So we're really kind of hoping to do that mid year if we can. Gating factor on that, you know, we need to get a, a Java implementation, maybe open JDK up and running on that. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Evan. Well, that just about wraps up this episode of Hack5, but before we get going, it's time to find out about the Technos Photo of the Week. Technos Photo of the Week. So Ben sent in a few photos and some links to his YouTube videos of this really awesome wall case mod that he did for his wife. It's lovely, and he put it in his living room. And the thing is so modern looking and clean and crisp. There's no wires coming out of it. I just loved it. I thought it was awesome, and it looks beautiful, like just this nice circular mod on the wall. It's, yeah. it's gorgeous. Well, the computers are are beautiful and they, they are be on display I agree and if you guys have beautiful mods that you want to share you can email them to us at feedback at hack5.org and put in the subject line technolust trivia time last week's trivia question was AMD's eight core CPU codename Zambezi retails under what name um, God, it's been so long since I've run AMD. Uh, Athlon, <laughs> I know, right? Me too. Athlon XP. I've been running uh, like a T Bird. What was I running? A uh, Ivy Bridge. Which one came out like two years ago? Oh, uh, that's Bridge? Intel. Yeah, Intel. Yeah. Oh, because you haven't done AMD. No, not in a long uh, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. See, I used to use the Socket A. Or was oh, it slot? yeah. Socket. Oh, one of those. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking anyway. about. Anyway, the one that's like a <laughs> Nintendo cartridge. You got to pull your CPU out and go. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and the answer to this week's trivia question was AMD FX. Now this week's question is, if the theoretical data rate of a 1x Blu-ray drive is 36, is that megabits per second? Yep, lowercase b. Approximately how long will it take for a 2 times drive to fill a single layer Blu-ray disc with data? I know, it's a math question. Half the time of the first? I don't know. It's a math we'll question. find out next week. <laughs> Is there like some caveat that I'm not thinking about? Maybe. Gosh, optical media. I know, Lose. gosh. Blu-ray discs. <laughs> Who uses that stuff? You can answer over at hack5.org slash trivia for a chance to win some swag. Okay, so what is the uh, big secret all about? So, I am engaged. How does that happen? Oh, um, generally, well, if they're not doing a fake proposal like my man did the night before he actually proposed, Lulz. you get down on one knee and you open a box and you give a lady a ring and then she says yes or no. Lucky for him, I said yes. I found a ring! Uh, did he say it's dangerous out there? Take, Take this! this with Take you! <laughs> Alright, so you hear that? Shannon's yes. no longer single, but if you're single and a techie female want to host the show, email We are getting rid of him and... that bum show in the kitchen. She doesn't matter. We'll see you next week. Trust your technolust. Bye.